We're going to keep moving forward in our unit on relationships by talking about a relationship you might be able to relate to, relationships among siblings. Not everyone gets to have a sibling. You might be an only child. But for many people, the connection they have with their siblings is a formative part of their childhood. So our big question directly relates to this relationship. What influence can siblings have on one another? Some other questions you could think about if you have siblings could be, how have your siblings influenced you? And how have you influenced your siblings? And here's a question anyone could answer, whether they have siblings or not. What have you observed about the way siblings interact with each other? So let's look at our vocabulary words that you'll encounter in this story. There's quite a few of them. We have ample, congested, diluted, increments, irresistible, marauding, minuscule, reiterated, renditions, serrated, unfurl, and venture. So let's look at some of these in sentences. We left early in order to allow ample time to find our seats before the play started. Ample is an adjective describing time. If you left early to get seats, the idea is that you will have enough time. So ample means enough or even plenty. Grandma says she prefers living in a small town to living in a big city where the streets are always congested with traffic. Well, if you've ever been in traffic, you know congested doesn't mean lots of room to breathe and spread out. Congested means tightly packed or full. Learning that I would have to speak in front of the entire school diluted my interest in becoming student body president. If you dilute something, you water it down, either literally, like diluting a liquid, or figuratively, as in that sentence. The speaker of the sentence is less interested in being president because he learned about the public speaking. So dilute means to lessen or reduce. Math concepts are often learned in increments because the basics must be learned before moving to harder problems. The context of this sentence puts the harder problems in contrast to these concepts learned in increments. So you get that idea that increments are small parts. Learning in increments is learning a little at a time. The pie on the counter proved irresistible to the dog who gulped it down in just a few bites. If it's irresistible, it's impossible to resist. The dog just couldn't stop himself from taking the pie. The bees swarmed around the beekeeper who was marauding their hives for honey. Now marauding generally means going around looking for something to steal or just looking to cause trouble. So in the eyes of the bees, the beekeeper is kind of like a criminal. He's there to attack and steal their honey. And yes, that's just a colorful way to describe the situation. Beekeepers are not actually criminals. The boy was embarrassed because the minuscule rip in the knee of his pants became a huge hole by the end of the school day. So the contrast implied between minuscule and huge makes it pretty clear that minuscule must mean small. Plus, it's just a longer version of mini, which you probably already know means miniature or smaller. All right, next sentence. The coach reiterated the importance of arriving early for the championship game. When you reiterate, you enforce or say it again. It's just, just another way of saying reminded. The version of the classical song I'm playing for my recital is easier than other renditions I have heard. Sometimes the easiest way to understand a word is just to learn a synonym for it or another word that means basically the same thing. For the word renditions, a synonym would be versions, which is the word used at the beginning of the sentence. Another version of something is the same as another rendition of something. It is easier to cut homemade bread with a serrated knife than with a knife with a smooth edge. If you've done much in the kitchen, you might already know what a serrated knife is, but if not, notice the contrast in the sentence. Serrated is contrasted with smooth, so that means it's different than smooth. And since it's a knife, the opposite of smooth is probably jagged, and that means pretty sharp with a blade kind of like a saw. A smooth knife would also be sharp, so that's not the distinction, or it could also be sharp. It's the jagged versus smooth that makes the difference for that word serrated. A sudden gust of wind caused the limp flag to unfurl, revealing the stars and stripes. So if a flag is limp, you can't really see the whole thing. If it's unfurled, it's kind of uncurled. It's flying like a flag is supposed to fly with the whole design visible. It is unwise to leave the safety of one's house to venture into a blizzard on foot. To venture is to go. The word has the connotation or suggestion of being adventurous. 
Well, that was a lot of words, and you won't run into all of them in today's reading, but when you do come across them, hopefully you won't find them too difficult to understand. Now, the genre for this work that you'll be reading is an autobiography. An autobiography is a work written by an author about himself. And in the case of this work, it's herself, because our author is Thing Ha Lai. We don't always discuss the authors of the works we're reading, just because that's not our focus in this course. But sometimes it's really important to know something about the author. Thing Ha Lai was born in Vietnam in 1965, which means that she was born in the middle of the Vietnam War. That was a long and brutal conflict that involved the United States. Lai's family moved to the United States at the end of the war. Her father was a soldier fighting against the communist forces. And in 1975, when Lai's family moved, she was missing in he was missing in action. So the family emigrated without him. Thang Ha went on to become a reporter and then a novelist. She's won awards for her fiction. What you are reading, though, is not fiction. It's an excerpt from the story about her life. So I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Let's talk about tone. Tone is the attitude of an author toward his subject. In fiction, an author often expresses his views on a subject through a character's appearance, actions, and traits. In nonfiction, such as an autobiography, an author may directly say how he feels about his life or about others. And let's move right to our reader's craft. As you read this autobiography, try to identify how life feels about the people and events that she describes. So you've read just one page, but you're beginning to get the picture of Thang Ha Lai's childhood. The title of this autobiography is A Pack of Brothers. So it makes sense that she would start off by describing these brothers. Let's take a look at the picture that's in your textbook. If you read the head note, you would know that Thang Ha had six older brothers, and that's how many you see in this illustration. So she gets right to the setting and establishes what the relationship was with her brothers and why they had to take care of her. So let's talk a little bit about that setting. The events in the autobiography take place in Vietnam during the early 1960s when the communist army was trying to take control. And here's a map just to give you a little bit of context of Vietnam in the 1960s. So Saigon, down here was the capital city now known as Ho Chi Minh City. Now let's look, look at a quote from this story. My father was missing in action, meaning that the opposite side of the war had captured him. My father remains missing in action. With my father gone, my mother and oldest sister worked. That left my brothers to feed me lunch, help me with homework, and keep me halfway clean. Back then, I failed to understand that they had crossed the gender line to care for me. Instead, I fumed at the injustice of being a girl in a world where boys had all the fun. So, of course, she's writing this autobiography, looking back on her life, but she still does a really great job of capturing the feelings that she had as a young girl. Now you're going to go ahead and read the next two pages and then we'll talk about what happens. So we know that it is wartime. There is a major conflict happening in the country and Thang Ha's father is a victim of the war. That's pretty serious stuff. You would think that people could think of nothing else. But Thang Ha is just a child. She didn't even know her dad because she was just a baby when he went to war and then disappeared. So what was Thang Ha concerned about more than the war? She was more concerned about not being able to do what her brothers did. She adored her brothers. Of course, she wanted to be just like them. They tolerated her, but look how she describes herself and her relationship with her brothers. My joy, their burden. Thang Ha admired her brothers and wanted to be with them. She enjoyed being around them, but she thought her brothers viewed her as a burden. Now, there's probably some truth to that. You may have a younger sibling, or you may be the younger sibling, and you might have seen that an older sibling can sometimes begrudgingly play with or help a younger sibling. That doesn't mean that the older sibling doesn't love the younger, of course. It can just be exasperating sometimes to have a younger sibling ask you for lots of stuff, especially when you're put into a position of great responsibility, like these boys were, although they're still just children themselves. Thing Ha tells the rather humorous story of her brothers trying to get her to take a nap. She describes how one would tie her in the hammock and swing her and then just beg her to go to sleep because he wanted to get to playing soccer with the other boys. You have this illustration in your book of kind of a visualization of the hammock, and it's easy to just picture 
Tanha lying there fighting against sleep because she so wanted to do whatever the boys did. One really effective thing that Lai does with her writing is to include sensory details, and it's these details that really help us picture and experience along with her. Let's look at just a few examples. She describes her twitchy limbs, the ear-piercing renditions, a smelly soccer ball, yellow flesh, sweet and floral, sweet beans and fresh-squeezed coconut milk. She's talking about these snacks, talking about their sugary potential and the freezing triangle. And then some figurative language, leaves slashed through skin like tiny swords. This would be an example of a simile. I'm just going to put that above there. We know it's a simile because it has that word like, a comparison using like. And then she describes one of the snacks as bags of miracle. And because it doesn't, it's a comparison, but it doesn't use like or as, we would call that a metaphor. And both of those are examples of figurative language. All right, let's look at just one more page and then we'll leave the rest of the story for next time. So let's talk about this last page that you read. How does Lai compare her brothers to the boys at school? Well, she describes her brothers as more fun and more interesting than the boys at school. Let's look at some character traits for Tenha, Thingha, and her brothers. Where would we put active, the character trait of active? It would probably put that with the brothers. She was active along with them, but they were more described in that way. Stubborn? Thingha was very stubborn. Mischievous would probably go with both of them. Humorous? Her brothers were funny, and so was Thing Ha. There were some kind of laugh out loud, loud, loud moments in this autobiography. Determined? Probably more with Thing Ha, because she was determined to be like her brothers and do what they did. And then the last one here we'll say is energetic. Really, probably could apply to both, but we'll put that more in the brothers category because of the way that she describes them throughout. And then the last incident that she recounted was about her haircut, and this is also kind of a funny story. How were the brothers irresponsible even though they were watching Thang Ha? Well, they cut Thang Ha's hair without caring about how it would affect her. And of course, there were consequences for them, and even how Thang Ha responds to those exhibits her stubbornness and her mischievousness. Why did Thang Ha keep her hat on longer than necessary? Well, she wanted her brothers to continue escorting her to school, taking her everywhere with them and buying sugarcane cubes. She wanted them to experience their punishment as long as possible. All right, so let's recap just a little bit. What is the main subject of the autobiography so far? It's the author's relationship with her brothers, right? What about her tone? What would you say Lai's tone is so far? Well, she has a humorous, lighthearted tone toward the events of her childhood and toward her relationship with her brothers. Well, I hope you're enjoying this autobiography so far, and even though Thing Ha's childhood is probably very different from yours, I hope you can find some relatable incidents. You're going to finish reading these excerpts, and we'll talk more about it next time.